Maybe we could start with kind of some basics of meditation research up to this point. Now, when I uh, last looked into this uh, pretty carefully uh, before I wrote my my book, Why Buddhism is True, which came out, I guess, about five years ago, mm -hmm. one of the one of the kind of consensus findings was that when people do certain kinds of meditation, mindfulness meditation, the closely related Vipassana meditation, one thing that happens in the brain is the so-called default network mode. Default mode network. Is that right? Is that the term? Yes. Default, mode, default network? mode network. Yeah. Becomes less active. And that's a network that I guess, among other things, uh, is activated when our minds wander, when we're not focused on a particular task, not reading a novel, or his mind's just kind of drifting to various things. And so one finding was like that gets calm. And I assume mm -hmm. that. That finding is still intact. In fact, I know you published a paper relevant to that. You were the lead author on a paper that was relevant to that, right? Yes, and we found that the default mode network is not only uh, less active when people are at rest if they've meditated a lot. So they're not meditating. They're just uh -huh. given no tasks to do. This is the prime time that the default mode network becomes active uh -huh. and um at rest, meditators activate the default mode network less than non-meditators. And when they're paying attention, they activate the default mode network less. So this appears to be a trait level biomarker of meditation experience. And it's the closest thing we have to a quantitative metric of meditation experience. Okay. Um, and I assume that tracks with your experience meditating um, I mean, you want to tell people uh, who may not have experience meditating, like what? Uh, just suppose you're at a at a at a vipassana retreat or a mindfulness meditation retreat. What? And you've never meditated. What? What are you kind of hoping will happen? Although I know some meditation teachers will say, "Don't hope, don't hope. Just let whatever <laughs> happens happen." Right? Just but, drop any idea right, of the goal. Right. Yeah. Right. But. Um, <laughs> But uh, describe the experience. Sure. And the experience will differ. It will have different flavors across different people. Um, but typically, if you're a beginning meditator, the goal for establishing your practice and moving forward, taking kind of the first step into a practice, is to be able to investigate your experience as it's happening right now. So not your ideas about your experience, not your predictions about what's likely to happen, not your thoughts and feelings about it, but just what can I sense mm -hmm. in my experience right now? And typically the way we do that is we aim our sensory apparatus at a, a sensory stimulus that's always around. So this is why the breath is such a common object to use mm -hmm. for meditation. The meditation object, by the way, that's lingo. That's just the thing you're paying attention to. Right. Um, so if you were going to start meditating on the breath, what typically happens is you begin by aiming your attention at your concept of what the breath is. And you end up kind of thinking about the breath and looking around for it. And um, over time, you start actually getting into the sensory experience like oh wait i notice my upper lip gets a little cooler when i inhale a little warmer mm -hmm. when i exhale so now you're having an experience of the breath rather than an idea about the breath right and that goes a lot further but that's kind of the introductory uh step into a meditation practice Okay. And it might seem uh, kind of ironic to people that you have to do any work to pay attention to your own sensory experience. But the thing about our normal kind of waking mode is like, if you think about sensory experience as kind of the things you, you feel or immediately perceive visually or auditorily, the way it actually works is you bounce around between those things and thought, like your feelings shape your thoughts. So, so, so like if you see someone who we hate, you'll, you will feel briefly the feeling of hate, but that'll immediately set your thoughts off in a certain direction. And that's a different way of being from actually remaining more or less absorbed in the sensory experiences themselves. And of course, remaining absorbed in those experiences changes 
the thoughts. You you don't you're you're less likely to get sent off on these thought trajectories, right? You see this happen with emotional experience also. I, anger is a really big one. If you have anger or stress, you have some experience early in the day that makes you angry or stressed. And then for the rest of the day, you kind of tell yourself this story. Oh, I'm angry because, and now I'm going to act like this because I'm angry. But if you actually check out how your body feels, uh, you'll, you'll have like this wave of anger, but often it will just dissipate if you stop telling yourself the story. So being able mm -hmm. to really feel what you're feeling, stress is the same way. There'll be times where you can really feel the stress. And if you're telling yourself the story, the story will seem like, oh, I've been stressed all day. But there are many, many moments of embodied relaxation that are kind of alternating with the stressful experience. If you could tune into that, it becomes a lot more bearable. Okay. And um, so once you establish some degree of concentration uh, or, or an ability to pay attention to sensory experience, and it really is, you know, more dramatic than it may sound to people, uh, the, the change that that alone brings in your consciousness. Yes. But in principle, you can go into various, at least two directions I can think of. Like one is like having attained some degree of equanimity, you can kind of uh, be, you know, open to your whole perceptual field and kind of be observing whatever's going on, sounds, uh, if your eyes are closed, images, uh, feelings, whatever. But another path is to remain intensely focused on whatever whatever the initial object of concentration was, right? And you can go deeper and deeper into that. Now, I myself, uh, the one time I had what seems to me like the, you know, pretty close equivalent of a psychedelic experience while just meditating which was intensely visual, like you're in another world and blissful, that I now recognize was through concentration, right? <laughs> I, I just stayed focused on the breath. And it was really the first time I succeeded for, for just minutes and minutes and minutes on focusing. Well, actually it was a combination of breath and sound. It was, the windows were open and there were these insects chanting. And, and I was actually, I actually was doing this thing where I focused on the breath on the inhale and then sounds on the uh, on the exhale. Mm. And I, I just stayed focused on that. And that just took me into another world. Now that's not happened since, but is that, is that characteristic of kind of con concentration meditation uh, as opposed to, well, I guess you would oppose it to mindfulness meditation, but you tell me what terminology you would use. Yeah, I mean, there's this great, taxonomy that Antoine Lutz um, came up with. And he binned meditative practices into three bins, uh, focused attention, open monitoring, and uh, loving kindness. So the okay. Bhava Vihara practice. And of course, each bin requires the other bins to work. You can't do loving kindness if you don't have some concentration on board. Right. Um, and some of us can't do it even then, by the way, but go <laughs> right, ahead. Yeah, some of us can't do any of these. <laughs> Um, but it sounds like what you were doing was a really interesting combo of focus on the inhale and then spaciousness on the exhale. Like when well, I, well, although when, even that was, yeah, I guess it was spacious, but it was it, it shifted to the auditory, very yeah. kind of direct, you know, intentionally. When I teach my beginner students, when I want them to have, when I want to point them at spaciousness, I have them use auditory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, input because there's just this inherent sense of a lot of spaciousness there. Whereas if we're doing visual or the breath, there's a kind of, um, narrowing of focus. So it makes it easier to concentrate in that direction. Yeah. And so to answer your question, uh, if you do these deep, deep concentration, you know, you hold your concentration on one object at the expense of everything else that's going on in experience, you can get into really interesting altered states. These are called absorptive states. And the jhanas are a great example of this. And there are a lot of people who describe these kind of psychedelic visual experiences from getting really, really concentrated on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's something to be said for the amount of resource that comes from going in the other direction. So if you get your concentration high enough and then you're able to open out and kind of rest 
gently your mm -hmm. attention on everything that's going on in experience. So this would be more of like an open monitoring. Um, right. If something large arises, a big emotional experience, a big visionary experience, there is a sense of being in touch with a lot of space mm -hmm. in which that experience can arise. So my teacher, uh, Michael Taft, uses the example of if you have 300 angry bees and they're in a tiny jar, you don't want to open that jar. But if you have the same 300 angry bees and they're in a gigantic field, that's fine. You could probably walk through that field. You'll be okay. Mm -hmm. So having the sense of spaciousness on board as a resource can really help when you get into the deeper, weirder, more visionary end of practice, like the like what you described. Yeah. And the open yeah. monitoring is, I, I think, useful because it's it's a part of the practice that you can kind of carry more readily into everyday life, right? I, I mean, yes. it, it, it's it's the, the part of practice that makes it easier to like see your anger arising in real life, like when you're at a convenience store or something, and mm -hmm. observe it rather than let it uh, capture your thoughts and behavior. It, it 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 right. It's like letting it be there, just like an airplane in the sky. Um, and if you're doing a lot of open, spacious practice, if something like that comes up in a meeting, for example, you could just drop in. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're doing a lot of ultra focused, you know, altered state practice on the set of sensations in your knee with your eyes closed, that's a little bit harder to do when you're driving. Thanks for watching Non-Zero Clips. To hear more of this conversation and others like it, subscribe to the Non-Zero YouTube channel or the Non-Zero podcast feed. And to gain access to exclusive podcast content, subscribe to Robert Wright's Non-Zero newsletter on Substack.